Okay. Well, we are live on Facebook, Donnell. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode five of Realtor Life with Donnell and Sharon. As usual, we are excited to be here with you tonight. Yes, And indeed. we're going to be discussing an interesting topic. But before I reveal what that topic is, I just wanted to go over one thing. I don't think that we mentioned this last week when we started, but the reason that Donnell and I have decided to do this every week is that we know that there are realtors and real estate agents out there who have questions about various things and maybe they're not getting the support that they need from their broker. Um, and so we want to be a source of information and mm -hmm. to help people get answers to the questions that they have about being a real estate professional. So that's sure. why we're here tonight. Yeah. And it's just us sharing our experiences uh, with other realtors so that they don't feel as though we're, we're not trying to come off as gurus or anything of that nature. We're just regular realtors that have we deal with real problems and issues just like everyone else and hopefully some of our experiences can help uh people to walk through this and navigate this uh interesting and exciting but sometimes challenging world of real estate absolutely absolutely so tonight's topic will be busting five plus of the most common myths and misconceptions that people have about being a realtor or real estate agent. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. one of the first things that we want to delve into before we go any further is to talk about the difference between being a realtor and a real estate agent. And yes. we know that there are a lot of lay people out there who don't know the difference. Mm -hmm. And there might even be some real estate professionals who don't know the difference. There probably are. <laughs> so to be considered a realtor, you must be a member of a local board of realtors. So for instance, I am a member, and I think Donnell is too, of the uh, Northeast Atlanta Metro Association of Realtors. And there are dozens of real estate boards across the Metro Atlanta area. It doesn't matter which one, that you're a member of, but you must be a member of a local board. And by virtue of your membership in that local board, you become a member of the National Association of Realtors. And as a member of the National Association of Realtors, you are required to adhere to a certain set of ethics. Real estate agents, on the other hand, are not members of boards and they're not required to adhere to those that code of ethics. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with a realtor, not only does that realtor have to adhere to state law pertaining to being a real estate agent and representing clients and customers in real estate <clears throat> transactions, they have to adhere to the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. Real estate agents only have to adhere to state law. And that's a big difference. Yes. That, that, that can, I think people use those terms interchangeably. As you said, some of the lay persons may just say realtor agent and not really know the difference. But in this day and age, uh, and, and, and we won't get into all the differences, but there can be a lot of crisis uh, situations, adversarial type situations. and We'll, we'll delve into this a little bit later on in the discussion, but real estate is, can, can be a very challenging uh, profession. But, and, and anytime you're dealing with money, okay, or the, and the potential to make a lot of money, sometimes you can have some unscrupulous people and people may cut corners or overlook certain things. But as realtors, as Sharon and I are, we are held to a higher standard. And from a from a client standpoint, I I would rather 
if I'm going to entrust someone with probably what is the, the largest transaction in most people's lives, I would want to deal with someone that is ethical, honest, and is looking out for my best interest, not just from a fiduciary standpoint, a money standpoint, but just you know, a, a person that's that's looking to do good versus quick, uh, quick and dirty, so to speak. Right, right. And um, one of the things that I'm sure most people don't know is that there are certain brokerages that require you to be a realtor. So for instance, our brokerage requires that it is not optional. Right. The brokerage that I used to be with required it. There are some brokerages where it is optional, mm -hmm. but one of the big differences, at least in Georgia, between being a realtor and being a real estate agent is having access to the official Georgia Association of Realtor Forms. Glad if you mentioned you that, are Sherry. not a realtor, then you have to use these other forms. And I'm not even so sure, you know, if they've been tested in court, mm -hmm. who's, who's drafting them. You know, I don't know anything about them because I've never had to use them. But, um, mm -hmm. but we've dealt know, with I, people that weren't realtors in certain transactions. And you and I both have found that one, there could be uh, a lack of knowledge. And two, there's definitely going to be a lack of the official Georgia Association of Realtors forms, which only a realtor has access to. Right. And so when you find yourself in a transaction with someone who is not a realtor and you're like the listing agent and they present this offer to you on these forms, and sometimes your, your listing will even say official GAR forms only. Mm -hmm. And they present you with those generic real, realtor or real estate forms. You either have to provide them with a copy of the GAR form so that they can redraft the offer on the official forms, or you end up redrafting the offer for them and sending it to them. You know, so it can just be real burdensome. There's um, more work. Yeah, extra work. Bit frustrating sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, what one of the things we do, Sharon, is keep it real. And we're not going to throw anybody under the bus. We're not going to mention names or brokerages or anything like that. We're not those type of people. But let's just say when you find yourself in a transaction with someone, it seems as though when you're typing out and redoing something that's already been done, and the other person just says, thank you, Sharon or Donnell, for redoing this offer all over again. And, oh, by the way, we need an amendment, but I don't have access to the forms, but you do. Would you mind doing the amendment? And would you mind making a correction? And would you mind doing this? It's almost, at some point, you're going to feel like, wait a minute, if I'm doing all the work, but you I'm splitting the commission. The commission. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that? Yes. And just to add a little extra salt, people may not know this, there is a, a, an extra fee to be a realtor than a real estate agent. A rather hefty fee. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. But yes, it is. that's a story for another day. We that's a story for another day. We're going to keep camera. it positive. Yeah. But, 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 the, but the point that we're trying to make is you pay for the privilege, and it is a privilege. Hey, Wanda. Hey, Wanda. Uh, you pay for the privilege to be a realtor versus a regular real estate agent. And yes, it's a little bit more money, but we are held to a higher standard. And that is something that we can offer our clients. And it is something that we wear with pride because we, we, we are the elite of the elite. And it's not, I mean, if realtors can associate with any brokerage. Obviously we have a little bit more affinity to EXP, uh, but the, the point is, is, is more than just the title. And we hold that in very high esteem. True. All 
All right, so let's get on to the next myth or misconception. Um, and what I have on my list is that every realtor makes a lot of money. Lots of money. <laughs> or at least Lots that's what people money. may. I, I don't have a money gun handy, <laughs> but uh, they don't tend to give those to realtors, uh, Sharon. But that, I think, is something that draws a lot of people to our industry. And I think an actor, and you can, there are some realtors that are well into the seven figure uh, number, okay? But I think we need to just set the, the, the myth correct. There's a lot that goes into that, okay? And there are a lot of factors that tie into that. The potential exists, yes. But I think just like that, that myth to me, Sharon, is just like the myth that all doctors and all attorneys make a lot of money and make seven to eight figures. Right. And, and surprisingly, I, I didn't know it, but all doctors don't make a lot of money. Doctors, I know this, doctors and nurses uh, have a lot of debt and I'm pretty sure attorneys do as well. Absolutely. <laughs> I still have some student loans that need to be paid off. So. <laughs> But let's talk but, about the commission. Let's talk let's, about that talk big, about fat yes. commission check. Yes, indeed. And how much of that we actually get to keep. Mm -hmm. So for purposes of this discussion, let's just assume that it's a $300,000 house. Okay. And the commission is 3%. So what's that? $9,000. $9,000, Sharon. You're rich. Okay. That sounds great. So there are some brokerages where the agent might get to keep 100% of that. And I say keep. Mm -hmm. I'm using that term very loosely. There are other brokerages where that $9,000 has to be split between the agent and the broker. Mm -hmm. And that split can vary just depending on the brokerage, how much productivity the agent has, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we need to tick off of the list is that a portion of that $9,000 goes to the broker. Mm -hmm. So for purposes of our example, let's just say that of that $9,000, the agent gets to keep 80% of it. So what's that? $7,200, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Still a nice, nice check. It's still a nice. nice check. But what else comes out of that check, Donnell? I've heard of something called E&O insurance. E&O insurance. And when, so who needs E&O? What's the purpose of E&O for those that may not know? Every realtor needs E&O insurance to protect us in the event that there is some mistake, some mm -hmm. error, something error. crazy happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, long gone for me are the days where I get an earnest money check from a <laughs> client and deliver it to my broker. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, that was one of my biggest concerns. Like, oh my God, if I lose this earnest money check, what's going to happen? Well, the e &O insurance could kick in to protect me. Mm -hmm. Or if I screw something up on the contract and it costs my client money, the e &O insurance can protect me. Mm -hmm. And if it could I'm be when you, I just want to say something real quick. You mentioned if you do something that costs your client money. So it could be the earnest money check that that's, you know, probably one of the most obvious, but it could be that you misrepresent or misconstrue information backwards and forward, and your, your client makes a decision that in the down the road costs them money. Right, right. So while E&O insurance is not cheap, you and I know that, in the big, it's, it's insurance, okay? So and, just and like when- 
and it's called errors and omissions insurance. Errors and omissions, yeah. Just a fancy way of saying malpractice insurance. Exactly. That's basically what it is. Yeah. And even though it's expensive, you don't think about it, you don't want to pay it, just like our, our regular insurance. When you have to pay your life insurance, health insurance, a more common one is your car insurance. When you say, well, I haven't had a, I haven't had an accident. This is just a waste of money. It's a waste of money until you have an accident. And had you not had that insurance, and I mean, those, those costs could be exorbitant. Same right. thing with this. The little bit of money that you pay for E&O, uh, malpractice insurance, so to speak, pales in comparison to when you, should you get sued, by anybody. And I don't, Sharon, you you were an attorney. I don't think people really still sue am. people. Oh, you still are. Okay. Good. Still am, good. just don't practice. Just don't practice. So you would be able to answer this better than most. When typically, when there's a lawsuit, do people sue people for $150 or $300? Oh, no. no. It's thousands, that, hundreds thousands. of thousands. So they're you just, know, you're just 30, getting 40, started. 50,000. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not just a few hundred dollars. And, and you know what? There are suits that involve smaller amounts, and those go into small claims court. Mm -hmm. But larger amounts, those suits are filed in superior court. And Bottom line is, it's worth paying that E&O insurance, which is only one of the things yes. that comes out of. So let, let's go back to the beginning. You said $9,000, 20% is going to go to the brokerage because we're on a, if the person was on an 80-20 split, right. that 9,000 is dropped down to 7,200. Right. Now we got to pay E&O insurance out of the 7,200 that's left. Right. So I've heard something about when you close a deal, you have to pay an FMLS fee or some kind of uh, MLS fee which could vary. Yes, that varies based on the amount of the transaction. Okay. What other fees? Because that $7,200 is shrinking. It, it seems shrinks. like by the minute. <laughs> Let's talk about the big one, Donnell. We got to pay the man. We got to pay Uncle Sam. Yep. We got to pay those taxes. Got to pay taxes on that. It's not you gotta free. pay those taxes. <laughs> and that's a big chunk of that $7,200 coming out. Yes, it is. Yes, it you is. Know, and, and I don't know what other realtors do, but I try to set aside, you know, and do my estimated taxes so mm -hmm. that I don't have a big tax bill come April mm -hmm. 15th. Mm -hmm. And typically what I do is peel 10% off the top immediately. And that's what I send to the IRS okay. every time I have a closing. Okay. So you got to pay those, you got to pay taxes on it, whether you're doing estimated taxes or you're waiting until April 15th and you're writing out a check to Uncle Sam, got to pay those taxes. Karen, I hate to say it, but uh, that $7,200 is shrinking every time you start talking about stuff. And I'm pretty sure you're not done. I'm not done. Unless you're like, unless you're the one realtor in America where people are breaking into your house to ask you to sell their house or <laughs> they just know you from our world famous Donnell and Sharon real estate life podcast, you probably are doing some form of marketing. Yep. Which that's a cost. Now, so Sharon, here, here's something. Does the brokerage pay you to market? No. So where is that now, coming from? The brokerage might market, but they're marketing the brokerage. Ah. So, you know, I haven't seen any commercials for our brokerage on TV, but I see commercials for our competitors Absolutely. on TV. Absolutely. But they're not saying, hey, we got this wonderful realtor here, Susie Smith. Mm-hmm. Let her list your house. Mm -hmm. They're talking and expounding on how fabulous the brokerage is brokerage and how is. long the brokerage yeah. has been in business and how the brokerage will do X, Y, and Z. Right. Right. But they're not marketing any individual agent. And really, they can't. 
because they have thousands of agents. Exactly. And that wouldn't be fair to all the other good agents or great agents. So that's another cost. Right. That falls so, on, on the realtor. Whether you're talking about running a Facebook ad, doing a paid ad on Instagram, maybe you want to be in one of those uh, throwaway magazines that mm -hmm. you see at the grocery store. Maybe you want to be, and I've done this one before, be on the grocery cart. Yeah, that's a good one. And that was not cheap. And I no. didn't get not one phone call oh, no. off of that. But oh, anyway, no. story for another day. Yeah. My point <laughs> is that whatever marketing we do to try to generate business, mm -hmm. it's up to us to pay for. Yeah. And I certainly have had assistance from a broker, you know, where I went to them and said, hey, I want to do a postcard campaign mm -hmm. for a, a seminar that I'm doing. You remember when we did the seller seminar, the seller workshop? Yep. And so sure. my broker paid for me to do this postcard campaign, but only because I asked her and she mm -hmm. was like, you know what? You never ask for anything. So the answer is yes. She didn't even think about it, but just generally speaking, Right. We are responsible for paying those marketing costs. Mm -hmm. Well, Sharon, I mean, and again, I'm I'm playing the the lay person uh, so that we can ex illustrate the point. But I know you've got a very economical car, and that car runs on goodwill and prayer. Okay, I know you don't really spend money on gas, and maintenance, and things of that nature. Oh, no, uh -uh. the car just takes care of itself. <laughs> just Donnell. takes care of it. Just you think it and you're moving. Donnell, <laughs> talking about the car. <laughs> you know what happened with my car, right? I do. <laughs> you know what happened with my car? Yes, I my do. My car was in the hospital for nine weeks. Nine weeks. Thank God. And I've only had the car for two and a half years. Oh, my. And it was, I bought it used, 2013 model year. Mm -hmm. Thank God I had the auto warranty. Yes. Because after all was said and done, everything that could have broke on the car, damn near broke. It broke. <laughs> after all was said and done, those repairs cost almost $9,000. Wow. Yes. Yes, two thirds of what I owe on the car. Okay. So, so, and, and if your car is like most people's cars, that's probably not the only repair that you'll ever do on the car. No, I've had flat tires. And then, of course, just the routine maintenance, oil changes, yeah. Yeah. things like that. As a matter of fact, my car's in the shop right now because oh. the battery died. And oh, he just wanted to check it out and make sure that it is just the battery Less and not hope. anything else. Less so hope is just the battery. My yeah. car is back in the hospital. Yeah. But and, and this, all of that this, cost. Yeah. Well, yeah. Plus, there's auto insurance. Yeah. And that's there's not that. cheap. No, it is not. And, you know, and my auto insurance, I thought, okay, well, I'm getting this new car. I had to get it because my other car was on its last leg. I had driven that car for 16 years mm -hmm. and I really didn't want to get a new car, but I had to. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even thinking about the auto insurance going up. Right. Right. Donnell, <laughs> that auto insurance is so expensive. It is yeah. so expensive. And you and would so think you're getting a newer model car it would have more of the latest safety and, and economical features and functions that the insurance, this is clearly better than what I was driving. That's what you would think, but you know what, since it's a sporty little car, mm -hmm. they're charging me more. You know, I went from a sedan to this little SUV sporty kind of vehicle. Mm -hmm. So I'm having to pay more. And then, you know, the auto insurance is a racket. So it just keeps going up, no accidents, no moving violations or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it just keeps going up. So again, a story for another day. But we say all that to say, 
you got to have a vehicle if you want to be a realtor. You can't do real estate in an Uber. You can't do real estate on Marta. <laughs> you know, it just a nice concept, like but it's not going to work. Yes. <laughs> so what other expenses are there? Yeah. Uh, and, and just for the record, our $9,000 check is not looking really good right about now. Uh, no, it's not. Oh, oh, I have one. Mm -hmm. And this is before you get to just your regular keeping a roof over your head kind of bills. Health insurance. Uh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> you know. What if you get sick? What if you get sick? And I know I have lived my life working for somebody, having health insurance, and I have lived my life being self-employed and not having health insurance. Yeah. And thankfully, right now, I have health insurance and it's affordable, but Good. being self-employed and long before uh, the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. when I was still practicing law, I got a health insurance policy that was $141 a month. And over 18 months, it went up to over $400 a month. And wow. so I let it lapse and I didn't have health insurance for... Got a good 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's only by the grace of God that nothing terrible yeah, happened. Really. You know, I had a couple trips to the emergency room that I had to pay out of pocket for, you know, mm -hmm. knee injury, whatever. But, you know, thankfully, no serious illnesses or anything like that, no major accidents. But you got to have health insurance. I mean, and I think in this day and age, it's more important than ever, you know, with COVID 19 and. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, all the craziness absolutely. in the world, but yeah, that's another absolutely. expense. Yeah. I mean, but but that's kind of why we're having this discussion because these are some things that that people may not think about if they are already a realtor before they become a realtor. Exactly. Or if they're a client just looking for a house and you know, people kind of have this myth or misconception that, you know, Donnell and Sharon got it going on. There. Yeah. I mean, look at those houses behind you there, Sharon. That's a beautiful house behind you. Clearly, you know, you're making a lot of money. I'll make you see this house behind me. Uh, that's beautiful. But the reality of it is once we pay these things and we haven't even, we're, we're just, I mean, you can't just, you know, send up a, a carrier pigeon. You got to have a phone, Sharon. And you can't have, you can't have, you know, your mom's flip phone. From 1989, <laughs> that's not going to work. You got to have a smartphone. Yes. That has good pictures, good picture quality. You got to be able to text. This is a, a quick information society we live in. You got to be able to get your email and sign documents on your phone. That's not to not, mention mm -hmm. to have the app to be able to open the lock boxes. You got to have. If you can't access the lock boxes, you can't be you. a real estate agent or a realtor. You mentioned the lock box. That's not free. $100 a pop, unless okay. you can find some used ones. And there's a monthly fee just for the access, even yes. if you don't own your own lock box. So the costs keep going and going and going. So I think we, we've kind of illustrated the point yes. that the potential exists in this business. And, and it's a great business. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I enjoy just being a, a realtor. I mean, you get to meet a lot of really good people and help a lot of really good people. I mean, there, there's that. nothing like, you know, when a person has gone through that process, especially a buyer, first time buyer, especially, and they're nervous, they're anxious, they're not, they don't know what to expect. And they're just waiting for that big gotcha. And then you get all the way to the end and the attorney says, we're done. Congratulations, here are your keys. That feeling to see that smile on their face and that feeling of relief is priceless. Yes. Okay. Yes. But let's not get it twisted. There are a lot of people that we deal, a lot of buyers that we deal with, Sharon, and, and in this competitive market, you may, it's not uncommon to show 10, 20, 30, I had one client, I showed over 60, it was 60 or 70 homes 
And then at the last minute, Sharon, they said, thanks, Mr. Henderson, but uh, oh. I think we're, we're going to go with, uh, we're going to counsel you and go with my brother-in-law. Oh, done now. Okay. Now, yeah. at that point, <laughs> and this wasn't right, you, Sharon, you know where I live. Yeah. This was a good, every time they were on the opposite end of town, so every trip, even if it was one house or 10 houses, that was 60 miles one way. And you get nothing at the end of that. But thank you. You got a grin and bear it. And so my, our, our point of, of, of this, and again, we, we've killed this one, I think. I think we've made the point. Yeah, we've beaten the dead horse, right? The horse is dead. He's buried six feet under. You can make a lot of money, but you can also spend a lot of money as well. And it's just something for all of us to think about before we jump into this adventure. And it is an adventure. You have good days, bad days, just like with any other profession. Yeah. Uh, and if it's for you, go for it. But just understand some of the costs associated with it. Yeah. And I know I have a term for uh, that. Mm -hmm. When you show somebody 50, 60 houses, I mm -hmm. call it franking because I had a client named Frank and he and I became really close because I started working with him right before I was taking some time off to have some surgery. Mm -hmm. And he got really, really anxious because he's like, oh my God, you know, we're just getting started. And this was in 2011. He said, we're okay. just getting started. And now you're not going to be able to help me. So I had the surgery on a Wednesday, was released from the hospital on, fr on a Friday. Mm -hmm. And a week from the Saturday after I was released, Frank came to my house and picked me up oh, and wow. over the next six or seven weeks until I was cleared to drive again, Frank would come and pick me up a couple days a week and we would go look at houses that and he awesome. only had, he had cash to spend, but only a little bit of cash. And, you know, this was in the midst of the recession. Mm -hmm. So he had like $35,000 to spend. Mm -hmm. And when I tell you, he drove me all over metro atlanta <laughs> douglasville lithonia snellville stone mountain decatur Wood, jonesboro river i mean we went wow. some everywhere <laughs> looking at houses uh -huh. and he and his wife finally bought a house over in rex but okay we were up into that 60 60 to 70 mm -hmm. house range and so oh. i coined the term franking like oh my god <laughs> I think I'm going to get Frank this time. So yeah, well, well yeah. your the original Frank was actually a good Frank because yes, because at least I around. did get yeah. him into a house. Yes, right, right. Yes. Yeah. All right. So back to business. Being a realtor, and this is kind of along the same vein of what we were just talking about as far as making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But being a realtor is a way to make some quick and easy money. Quick and easy. And so Everybody I think franking that. is a great segue into this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There quick is nothing easy. quick or easy about being a real estate agent. And no. my advice to anyone who is considering a career in real estate, if you're thinking it's going to be a quick and easy way to make money, don't become a real estate agent. Just don't do I, it because I agree. you are going to be profoundly disappointed when mm -hmm. you get into this business and see the amount of work that it takes to get to the closing table and get that commission check. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It is dealing with clients, some of whom, like Donnell was saying, are nervous. They have mm -hmm. a lot of questions. Sometimes they're going to ask you the same questions repeatedly. Some can't make a decision. They have people off stage chirping in their ears, making it yes. difficult for you to do your job. 
Yes. There is attention to detail. There's dealing with contracts. There's dealing with the other agent who may or may not know what they're doing. Correct. Unrealistic There's expectations. Unrealistic expectations, thinking that their $200,000 is going to get them a five bedroom house on a full <laughs> finished basement on five acres and we'll having wait. to manage all of that and, you know, bring yeah. them back to reality. Yeah. You know, there is just a lot that goes into it. This yeah. business is not for the faint of heart. It you is got that right. for people who do not have people skills. If you are not a people person, if you are not able to manage expectations, manage emotions and things mm -hmm. like that, this is not the business for you. If you cannot, or if you're not comfortable with delivering bad news, you really need to evaluate whether you want to take this on because like I said, some days are going to be the highest of the high. You couldn't put a, a, a dollar associated a dollar amount with the euphoria that you feel on some days. And it feels good, Sharon. Uh, it let's does. Just, just, just keep it real. When you it walk out of that attorney's office, with a four, I haven't had a five figure check yet, but a high, you know, 9,000. Well, I'll take that back. I haven't had a, a, a one, or, one or two large, very large check. That feels good. Okay. It feels good when that buyer reaches their, their dream, their walk out with the keys. Yeah. Those are the highs, but there are also some lows. And the lows can be gut wrenching, and and again, we're just keeping it real. Uh, you got to really be prepared uh, emotionally. Uh, the letdowns can. I mean, some people are, will attack you, and you're just a mess. Yeah, uh, I've you know, certainly we, had that happen, Donnell. Oh yeah, yeah, we all have. And, I mean, and I I've had one instance where the client was just inexplicably angry with me over something that didn't have anything to do with me. He mm -hmm. wanted to have a pest inspection done on a particular day. And I delivered that information to the listing agent. The listing agent comes back and says, my clients aren't available that day because one of them is having surgery. So there will be nobody there to let you into the home and there is no lockbox. Mm -hmm. um, I think they had removed the lockbox once we went under contract. So um, these are the days that they would be available. And so I gave my client the alternate days. And when I tell you, this man lost his mind to the point where I called my broker and was like, I'm having a problem. You know, can you talk to him? Because I'm actually afraid. Wow. And I didn't go to the closing and he, he didn't make any blatant threats, mm -hmm. but it was just this, this fury. I mean, it was, yeah. it was you dealing just with real people. inexplicable that this could make the man as angry as, as he was. And he, yeah. I ended up getting an email from his assistant, who I think was really his daughter-in-law telling me not to contact him anymore. And I'm like, you don't have to worry. Well, Thank my you. broker had reached out to him and the uh -huh. assistant emails me back saying, I told you that he said, and I'm like, look, that's my broker. I said, and let's right. just take a step back from this. Mm -hmm. I don't know you mm -hmm. and I can't communicate with you unless I receive something in writing from him authorizing mm -hmm. me to do that right and so he typed up a little email and sent it to me and told me that I was authorized to deal with his assistant but I didn't even go to the closing because I was afraid yeah of what might happen at the closing and the listing agent ended up calling me afterwards and saying oh my and I had told him you know I'm I won't be at the closing today but I didn't go into any detail mm -hmm. and um he called me afterwards and he says, Sharon, when I tell you that man threw you under the bus, 
and rolled over you <laughs> and backed up. And he reversed. Over you. He said he talked about you mercilessly. And he said, the whole time I was just sitting there thinking, this is not the same agent that I've been dealing with because she has been nothing but, you know, professional. And he said, what yeah. happened? And I said, you know what? He got pissed off because he couldn't have the pest inspection done when he wanted to do it. That's what all of this stemmed from. And he said, I'm so glad you weren't there. He said, yeah. because I think that he might have tried to do something to you. He said, I really, really do. He said, at the very least, I think that the police would have need to have been called. That's at the how. least, at the least, the police yes. would have been called. Yes. That's ridiculous. It, but I mean, but, but Sharon, crazy. that's just the, I mean, a lot of times I hear other agents say, and there's a term we use in the industry, it's manage your client. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I understand the concept of that. Yes. Okay. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with a grown person. You can't make anyone do anything. Right. Okay. And if a person chooses, I had unfortunately a, a, a situation where there was some discrepancy. We got all the way to the closing and the client decided not to come to the closing. Mm -hmm. They had their reasons and to them, they were valid. But we we talk about contracts and is and in this business contracts are big everything is, is predicated everything. on a contract okay and if the con you agree to do something or not to do something everybody agrees so that we all have a meeting of the mind we're all on the same page in layman's terms and in i would say 95 percent of the cases Things move like they should. But if a person chooses, I mean, we can only do so much. We literally are, in a lot of cases, the messenger. And if I can only, you know, and, and that, that might be a topic, you know, down the road as to what can you do realistically, okay? Mm -hmm. And what can you not do? And, and sometimes we as agents and realtors get mad with each other because something that the other client didn't do or did do or, or asked or whatever. Should have done. Yeah. Should have done. Yeah. Could have done. And we're at the end of the day, you're dealing with real people. And some things rub people the wrong way. And they're not, they don't know. I mean, I'm, the way that we, we deal with disagreements in general, just in society, sometimes uh, is not, people argue, and we can have a disagreement, okay, difference of opinion, but we gotta have boundaries. And in real estate, the contract is one of those boundaries that kind of keeps us. You can only go this far before something else happens by yeah. this time or so on and so forth. But and the know, clients- like, One of the things that, well, let me put it this way. I feel that one of my biggest assets as a realtor comes from my time of, of having practiced law. Uh -huh. And like, I'm a rip the band-aid off kind of person. If there's bad news to be delivered, I'm a deliver it, followed uh -huh. by, okay, here's how I suggest we resolve it. You know, we have sure. option A, B, and C to resolve whatever the issue is. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have a problem delivering bad news. And I'd rather go ahead and just, like I said, rip the bandaid off and get it over with yep. than to sit on it and it's let it fester change. and let the client wonder what's going on or, you know, right. keep right. them in the dark, which is just a terrible thing to do. Correct. But procrastinating on delivering that bad news isn't going to change the fact that there's bad news to be delivered. It could possibly and, make it worse. And so I pride myself on being a problem solver. Mm -hmm. And I can think of any number of times over the years where I've had to explain to a client, one of the things about a real estate transaction is that there are a lot of moving parts yes. and no one person has control over all of those moving parts. Nope. The listing agent has things that are within his or her purview. The selling agent 
the buyer's agent has things that are within his or her purview. The closing attorney has things that are within his or her purview, the lender and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But no one person in the transaction controls all of that. And no. so, you know, that's why there needs to be an open line of communication. Everybody Absolutely. needs to be on the same page. And unfortunately, so many times there's some little loose end. One person isn't holding up their end of the bargain. Mm -hmm. And that can yeah. complicate matters, you know, prolong things, whatever. And that's yeah. why I try to be the one who's being proactive, you know, staying on top of the various dates and deadlines and things mm -hmm. like that. And just trying to do my part to make sure that the transaction is moving along as best I can. But like, I don't have anything to do with the loan. I don't have any control over underwriting. The inspection, you know? the appraisal. Yes, yes. Getting the closing documents to the closing attorney, getting the money to the closing attorney. None of those things are within my purview. All we can do is explain. Sharon, we <laughs> had one that I had one that closed today. And it could have been an issue over the smallest of things is basically misunderstanding, or you could say miscommunication. Mm -hmm. The buyer was from New York, buying a property here in Georgia, cash. And what she wants, she asked for using New York, her New York terminology was the title report. So I had given her the attorney's contact information, but she felt more comfortable with me. So she called me and said, you, Donnell, need to send me the title report. Obviously, I don't have the title report. I can't send it. So I called the attorney and relayed the message and I CC'd her on the email of what she was looking for and could, she, could he send the title report prior to the closing today? This was last week, mm -hmm. which he did. He got the email, sent the title report over so she could check it out. She said, that's not what I want. I want the title report, which shows the debits, the credits, how much I'm going to bring, how oh, much the seller's going to... talking about the closing statement. Talking about the closing statement in Georgia terms. Uh -huh. But in New York, they call that the title report. Interesting, interesting. But again, I'm, the, the point I'm trying to make is in this business, you can't just be siloed in that this is what I do. That's not my job. Somebody better figure it out. A lot of what we do is triage. And we are counselors, we calm people down, we, we're educators, we explain contracts and why this had to happen. We, uh, you know, sometimes go a little bit outside of our lane within legal reason, okay, i.e. common sense. And we make, we, we bridge the gap. A lot of what we do is bridge the gap. And what I try to do is put myself on the other side, because at some point you're going to be the listing agent or the selling agent. And an extra word or two or sentence might just bridge the gap. So I could have said, well, we sent you the title report. Sorry, that's it. Right, right. But I asked a couple more questions to understand. And, and when she got it, she said, oh, yeah, this is what I wanted. Everything's fine. But you got to have a lot of patience. And, and, Again, we beat this one to death. We, we probably have time for one more. But what we're showing with this example, simple and easy, are rarely used in a real estate agent's life. Right. We, we've just we've just touched on some of the complicated scenarios. This and is I'll not necessarily this easy. Too. If you are not a person who has more of a proactive Absolutely. personality, if you are more reactive this might not be the business for you because sometimes things are going to come at you and you don't necessarily have the answer to it. Mm -hmm. And you might have to do some research to find the answer. Like mm -hmm. I can give an example. I had a client who was, um, I guess, purchasing. Yeah. 
I think he was the purchaser uh, and he had VA financing. And I get an email or a phone call from the loan officer talking about the Tidewater Initiative. And I'm like, what the hell is the Tidewater Initiative? <laughs> is that something from the Born Identity or? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And that's their way of saying that the appraisal came in low. Yeah. But I immediately went to Google and I'm like, what in the world is that? What is that? <laughs> and I got the answer. And I'm like, okay, I wonder how come they can't just say that. Why do they have to use Tide Water Initiative? And I might not even be given the right uh, term. As if we don't it. have enough confusing terms in real estate already. Right, right. So, you know, you just need to be proactive and have the type of personality where you are willing to look for solutions. Yes. I can't tell you how many deals I have saved mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. up with something creative and communicating with the other the agent in the deal, yep. you know, and just figuring out a way to make the deal happen. And that's when your clients love you. Like I have one young lady, I represented her and her husband, when they were selling a house, she has referred me to her mother. She's mm -hmm. now studying for her real estate exam and wants awesome. to, you know, join us as soon as she passes. And that's awesome. You know, but she just remembers the lengths I went to mm -hmm. to get their house sold. Sharon, I'm in the business because my realtor took care of me. Did she educated me. Was. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you in a minute, but I got to boost her up first. She educated me. She was professional. She gave me different options and solutions. And she just made me feel comfortable. And I'll admit, I didn't know what I was doing. But it wasn't, it, it became a situation where it's not about the money. It's about, I felt like I had a team behind me. And it was just, just her. But she gave me that level of confidence to move forward with an investment transaction. And then we did several more to the point that I joined her team as a realtor. And then guess what? She joined my team. And now we're on the podcast here. That was Sharon Smoot, by the way. <laughs> Both didn't know that. Sharon was my realtor. But it, 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 it really goes down, comes down to when you feel that confidence and your realtor can do that. and if you're open to listen and explain things, again, this is this can be very complicated and intimidating for a, a new buyer. But and if, even and, for a new seller, and even for a new who's seller, selling for Absolutely. the first time. Absolutely. So I, I'm, the only thing I'll say, and then we'll move on, is you mentioned if you're the type of person that is reactive and quick to fly off the handle and quick to point the finger at somebody else, you said it very diplomatically and professionally, you may want to reconsider becoming a realtor. I'm just gonna keep it real. Please do not get into this business because we got enough of those type people already. We don't need <laughs> any more. We need some nice, proactive people willing to uh, just stay calm in a tense situation and bring clarity and, and compassion because most of the things, like you said, Sharon, you got inspectors, appraisers, attorneys, paralegals, you got the real estate agents on both sides, you got their transaction coordinators, you got the underwriters and the lenders who may use different terms, all trying to move this transaction to a close. And then, and, and you mentioned something, and this may take us into our last one, you, it's not done until it's done. And you and I both have been in transactions where we had made the mistake of counting that check and putting it towards that bill, that car that needed some new tires. And then they got all the way to the end and something happened and it blew up. Yeah. So never count it until you're walking away from the closing tape. And even then, be cautious. Yes. Yes. Um, but anyway, that, that one was, was a good one. What what's what's another one we have before our time ends? And I know we only got a few um, minutes, but let's tackle one you more. You know, but we we have a few more on the list, and maybe we can do a part two 
of that this. might be a good idea. But um, let's talk about leads. So are you going to get leads from your broker when you become Generally, a real estate agent no. or a realtor? Generally, no. And if you do, they probably aren't the freshest, most motivated leads. Some brokerages do, but typically those leads are not ones that will, in most cases, lead to a closing. Meaning you are responsible for your own leads at the end of the day. And there are many different ways. There's a difference between cold leads and warm leads and uh, sphere of influence, et cetera, et cetera. But, but to answer the question in general, no. Unless- well, I will tell you, Donnell, 14 plus years with the same broker, mm -hmm. I got zero- Zero leads. Leads from that broker. Okay. And, and there is a caveat to that. I got a couple of rental- I was gonna leads. say, I have, I've gotten- <laughs> And these were rental listing leads. So that's a little bit different from okay. your story. Yes. But yep. generally speaking, I don't think that there are many brokers giving out leads. And if they are giving out leads, there's some condition right. you know, attached to them. You right. might get the lead, but you're not going to keep all the money. Yes, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And I, I know some brokerages do give you good leads, but as you said, the caveat is you may only, only make maybe 30% because that is split. You go out and show the property, but then someone else actually writes the contract and then someone else actually walks, works with the client. So it's kind of split up. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not going to mention names or anything, but I, one comes to mind that, you know, there, there's always going to be something that you give up, but in general, the answer is no, you're going to be responsible for your own leads. And, and which kind of goes back to the first topic. If you're responsible for your own leads, you that's another cost. That's another cost. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And even, you know, like I've never done door knocking. And I guess there are still agents who do that. That's mm -hmm. probably, you know, one of the cheapest ways mm -hmm. to get some leads, but it's super time consuming, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there, are, I guess, other low cost things that you can do to generate leads, but leads are not cheap. And I've spent my share of money on leads. And what I have found mm -hmm. over the years is that it's a waste of money. Karen. Um, you have spent a little money over the car over those years. I have spent a truckload of money, and we won't even sharing that right there is a whole episode of what not to do when it comes to leads. Okay, and we won't Maybe even get we into need to a, add that to our list for future. Uh, I I would be embarrassed video. to tell you how much, but the point is, your last statement sums it up. It's a waste of money. That, that just sums everything up in one nice little package. Uh, if you're paying for leads, overall, you may close one, but you're, it, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. Yeah. But the amount of money, the number that is going to negate any gain that you may uh, have with buying leads is going to be so minuscule that you finally will say, hey, I closed one. But... I had to go through 500 to close one. And I didn't just spend, it's not a dollar a lead. It's a lot more than, it's, you know, right, anywhere right. from $10 to $50 per lead. That's not really worth it. Yeah. And I know when I for a lot of, a lot of young agents, new, when I say young, young in the business, newer agents, you want success and leads, they're going to be coming at you from all different places. Oh, and it's so seductive. It's so seductive. Yes. yes. You know, and having you thinking, oh, you know, they're just going to drop these clients in my lap. And you're going to have too many to deal with. Yeah. We, we, we know that that doesn't work. We have some strategies and processes on our team that are much more cost effective and fun. 
I mean, we've got some things in place and that that we do um, that we've kind of proprietized, I'll say, and we work as a team to help each other out and just show you how you can do the business without going into a lot of unnecessary debt with leads. And on that note, we are going to finish it up like we like to finish up every week by extending an invitation to anyone who is already in the business and maybe looking to change brokers, anyone who is just getting their real estate license and you haven't decided where you want to hang your license. Mm -hmm. We'd love to chat with you about everything that EXP has to offer. And the thing about EXP is that it doesn't matter what state you're in, you can join our team, which is Team Limitless, if you are in California, New York, Chicago, any of the 50 states, uh, Puerto Rico, Canada, Great Britain, where else, Donnell? Um, there, there are too Africa, many things. South Af Africa. Um, Australia. All, yeah. There are basically, I think, 12 countries other than, than North America that, that we're in and all over the place. EXP is growing as a brokerage. They offer so many things, too many to list here. That's an episode all in itself. Yes. But uh, we are excited. Our team is growing every day and we are just excited. I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons we do this is that we've got agents with 16 plus years and agents with six days worth of experience right <laughs> so and everything in between and we welcome everyone to our team to help walk you through this process we have a lot of fun on the team and we're just looking to bring other people in and just share we really are a family we we call it a team but we really are a family yep and you will have support and mentorship and you know, just a sounding board, someone to ask questions, we will be there for you. Yes, indeed. And we are just so excited about the future and everything that EXP has to offer. Absolutely. And, you know, we'd love to share that with you yeah. and bring you on board. So reach out to us. I am going to put my contact information in the chat. And, and I know we'll same. do the same. And I will also add this info to Facebook. Look at that. There we go with all of that good contact information. Mm -hmm. So I will add that to the Facebook feed as well. And we will be back next Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. for episode six. We don't know what the topic is, but we promise you it will be interesting and we will have another fun and enlightening discussion. Absolutely. And you can see both of us have a silly side, you know, so it's not all serious and stern. Exactly. You know, we like to bring some levity. We're real people. Each of our episodes. <laughs> we are real people. Yeah. So on that note, I guess we will call it a night. Everyone have a good evening. Thanks for joining. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Take care.